Give it up for Jimmy. Oh, yeah. Oh my God! Look at you guys. It's good to be back. It's good to be back seeing all your beautiful faces. Give it up for yourselves, man, for being here tonight. Thank you. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. And Asian people, where we at? Asian people. Look at it. Look at you guys. This is great. I'm so proud of my Asian people. There's so much excellence out there going on, a lot of people representing. It's never been a better time to be Asian. I say this every year, I know. <laughs> but truly, this is our time. I mean, come on, we got BTS now. Come on. That's us, that's our people, they're doing it. I'm so proud of them, man. Biggest band in the world, probably ever since the Backstreet Boys, and they don't even have to speak English. <laughs> I love my BTS, man. Even white people know BTS now. That's progress, that's progress. I had a 15 year old white kid come up to me trying to explain to me the different members of BTS. He was like, oh, this is Jungkook, he's kind of like the lead singer, and that's Jimin, he's really cool, and he also raps. I'm like, dude, they look the same to me. I didn't want to say it. I couldn't say it as an Asian person, but they all just look like me, with pink hair. I can turn the whole show to a BTS concert right now. All right? Yeah, this is, this is Jimmy. This is Jimin right here. You don't know. You have no, you don't know. You don't know. Smooth like butter. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not, I'm not gonna do any of that. I'm not gonna do any of that. I love my people, man. I love BTS. You guys probably heard in the news, they gotta go to mandatory Korean army. Right, the most popular people in the world, they gotta go sign up for Korean military. That's some gangster shit. <laughs> Imagine how scared you'll be when you encounter BTS on the battlefield. <laughs> you're in battle, you're already kind of shook. You're in a field of grass, and a little puff of pink hair just pops up. <laughs> you're like, yo, what the fuck was that? Is that a unicorn? And then six more pink hair pop up. You're like, we're surrounded! And the last thing you see is just this. <laughs> That's some gangster shit. I'm proud of my people, man. I'm proud of my people. You know, a lot of great representation out there. I see some of you guys still wearing your mask. I still wear my mask, no shame in that, right? It's all good, it's all good. I wear my mask not because I think I'm gonna get sick, but because I just don't want to talk to anybody anymore. <laughs> but I'm still surprised when people come up to me, they're like, oh my God, Jimmy? I'm like, how did you know? <laughs> how did you know? How many other Asian guys did you go up to <laughs> before it happened to be me? You don't know, you don't know. Underneath this mask, I could be Aquafina. you don't know. <laughs> And look, I'm not saying that all Asian people look alike, okay? I'm just saying that me and Aquafina look alike. <laughs> and we both look like we should be in BTS. <laughs> Love all the representation out there, man. But it's not just celebrities. I'm very proud of the everyday people out there representing. That's the important part, you know what I mean? No, no, no. I'm very happy for this one particular person. I'm really happy for that old Chinese lady in Chinatown who's been wearing a mask since 1995. Her life just suddenly made sense. Before the mask mandate, everybody looked at her as like, ooh, why is she wearing a mask? That's so random. She's not random, she's a fucking trailblazer, okay? She started wearing a mask, now everybody has to wear a mask. She's like the Kendall Jenner of Chinatown. <laughs> she must've been so happy when this mask mandate happened, just laughing at everyone. 
It's like, <laughs> look at you, idiots. <laughs> I told you to put on a mask. Now the CDC follows me. <laughs> she was prepared. She didn't just have a mask. She had gloves on from when she's driving. She had the full face shield that comes down looking like Daft Punk. That's my girl right there, man. Asian people, we're ready for this shit. Social distancing, we've been doing that for centuries. We don't like all that hugging and touching and all that. You know, when we see each other, just a nice bow. That is, that is socially distanced. If you're really Asian, you ever see two really Asian people, it turns into a bowing contest to see who's more respectful, to see who can bow lower and more away from each other until you just fold it in half and you go home. That's social distancing, people. That's right. That's right. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's everybody should be a little more Asian. A lot of people in this country, Americans, you know, like, we're not ready for this. All the rules, we're rebels, man. We don't like following rules. People are like freaking out. They're like, mask mandate? No. I'm like, dude, it's just a mask. Just put on a mask. They're like, it's not just a mask. It's the government. <laughs> yeah, it's the government fear-mongering. I'm like, what is that? They're like, yeah, it's fear-mongering. They want you to be scared of everything so you're obedient and you're scared and you follow the rules. I'm like, oh, that's called fear-mongering? <laughs> then my mom must have invented fear-mongering. <laughs> That's what it's called. Ever since I was five years old, my mom had me believe that anything I do would make me sick. You go outside without a jacket, you get the flu. You go to bed with the fan on, pneumonia. God forbid you fall asleep with wet head. You don't wanna wake up, that's it, you're dead. That's it, you're dead. That's fear mongering, man. I'm not scared of anything anymore. I don't think I have any fear anymore. I used to watch a show, Fear Factor. You guys remember that show? Yeah. Yeah, Joe Rogan hosted Fear Factor to make you face your fears, like jump off a helicopter, eat crazy shit like pig intestines and sentry egg. I ate that shit for breakfast. <laughs> this is nothing to me. Fear is not a factor. <laughs> I do remember when I was like 10 years old, little boy. I was very scared because there was this one kid, pretty sad story. In my class, he had childhood leukemia. And then he lost all his hair to chemo and everything, looking real frail. And I was really scared. I was like, oh my God, is he going to be okay? And my mom, she's a great mother. She saw how scared I was. So she came up to console me. She was like, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy, you see, this is what happens when you play too much video games. <laughs> That's fear-mongering, okay? I never played a game of FIFA after that. My mom was like the original fake news. <laughs> it's good to see everyone here, man. I think collectively as people, we've all been through a lot in the last few years, man. You know? And we made it out. We made it out. We're better for it, you know? I feel like I mentally aged like 20 years. Like the first day I walked outside, for some reason, I just walked out like an old Chinese man. I just came out of my house like this. I was wearing flip-flops and a puffer vest. My outfit made no sense. My feet were cold, chest sweat. My posture looked like shit, but I was still judging everyone. I was just like... I'm an old man now. I don't even like going outside anymore. All my friends, they back to normal, right? They're like, oh, Jimmy, you want to go to Coachella? I'm like, nah, no seats. <laughs> oh. That doesn't look fun to me. Six hours standing in the desert? Fuck that. 
And you see all these kids, like with the Instagram posts, you know, it's always like people just like jumping around, dancing, and then all these buff dudes got like girls on their shoulder. I'm like, dude, you're not even going to a concert, you're doing CrossFit, how's that fun? <laughs> The only concert I've been to this year, I took my girlfriend to a Don McLean concert. Yeah, you guys know who that is? Yeah, a couple people, thank you, thank you. Don McLean, for you guys that don't know, sang the song Bye Bye Miss American Pie. Yeah, he's old as shit, dude. He's 77 years old and so was his audience. It was my favorite concert I've ever been to. On a ticket, it says the show started at eight, started at 7.59. He didn't have an opener. You know, he just came on stage with a guitar and started singing. It was awesome. Nobody stood up to like obstruct my view because frankly, everyone had a bad hip. It's great. Still got home in time to watch the 10 o'clock evening news. That's my kind of evening. You know what I mean? I don't like going outside anymore. Too many crazy people, too many weirdos. One time I went to this dive bar in a military town, San Diego, big military town. I love my military, okay? But I think sometimes, yeah, yeah, but I think sometimes military people get a little too passionate. You know? Thank you, thank you. Exactly, my point right there. Thank you. I love military, but they're just too passionate. Like I was at a dive bar, this one military brother came up to me who was just like, hey man, I wanna buy you a drink. And I'm like, no, no, thank you. I can, I can buy my own drink, thank you. And he's like, no, I wanna buy you a drink. So at this point, I thought either he wanted to take a selfie or he wanted to fuck me. <laughs> so I'm like, no, sir, I think I can buy my own drink. And then he started telling me his whole life story. He's like, you don't understand. I want to buy you a drink because I was stationed in Okinawa for four years. <laughs> and you guys have been nothing but nice to me. I'm like, you guys, you guys. Okinawa's in Japan, I'm Chinese, sir. And he's like, it doesn't matter, man. It doesn't even matter. I'm like, sir, I think it does matter, right? I'm pretty sure the only reason you were stationed in Japan was to keep an eye out on Chinese people like me. It does matter. He was like, it doesn't even matter, man. I still love Pad Thai, okay? No. Maybe that guy run into BTS on his next tour, who knows? <laughs> My point of saying all of this is Asian people, we don't all look alike. We don't all sound alike. You know, we don't even, we don't even do anything alike. We're just people, you know, right? Like everybody's different. Thank you, white lady, thank you. Thank you, one white lady, appreciate it. Thank you. She teaches magnet school down the street, a lot of Asian students. <laughs> So tonight, I want to offer you guys an advanced lesson on how to tell Asian people apart, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm so good at telling Asian people apart, I don't even need to look at you. I can tell you what kind of Asian somebody is by the sound they make when they're disappointed. Because <laughs> disappointment is our strongest emotion. Whenever we get disappointed, our ancestor just comes out and you can't hide that, you know? Like for example, I'm Chinese, I know Chinese people very well, okay? When Chinese people get disappointed, we're just disgusted. We don't want to look at you. When you disappoint a Chinese person, they're just like, oh, you, shh. <laughs> like they just walked into a smoky room and they gotta clear it, just like, shh. <laughs> See, that's Chinese people. Japanese people, when Japanese people get disappointed, they just want to know why. They ask you a question. When a Japanese person gets disappointed, they're just like, eh? <laughs> eh? <laughs> and that's it. You can go disappoint a Korean person. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> this Korean brother might fuck you up, okay? Korean people are intense, they're ready to fight. But they're my favorite type of people because they're very emotionally honest. A Korean person will let you know when they're disappointed. They're real guttural with it, you know what I mean? 
when you disappoint a Korean person, they're like, Oh! <laughs> Shiba! <laughs> but they're still very Asian, so they're still real polite. They'll thank you with that. And they're like, Oh! Shiba! Mida! I don't even speak Korean. <laughs> but I watch Squid Games. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love that show. See, that's great representation. Number one TV show in the world, man. And they just spoke their native tongue. That's representation right there, man. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. That's right. That's right. But I'm most proud of the fact that I finally have an easy Halloween costume. Some of you guys don't understand the struggle for an Asian guy when it comes to Halloween. Our outfits are limited. I was Bruce Lee for six years. <laughs> but this last year, I had the best Halloween costume. All I did, I went to Amazon, got like a matching like tracksuit, put three numbers on my chest, and I found myself an Indian friend. It was, a <laughs> it was such a great Squid Game costume. Somebody came up to me, he's like, oh my God, you look just like the girl in Squid Game. <laughs> It's like, oh, Shiva! <laughs> Me down. I'm proud of all the representation out there, man. Yeah, that's right. Have you guys seen the show Silicon Valley? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was my first big break, man. I was so grateful to be a part of that show. But that was a few years ago, and I always felt like I was the only Asian person representing, right? I felt so much weight on my shoulder. Like every year, we got very lucky. We get nominated for an Emmy, so we get to go to a great ceremony. But every year, we knew we were going to lose. <laughs> because all the good shows have front row seats, you know? <laughs> Veep, Game of Thrones are all here. We're way the fuck in the back by the exit sign. But it's okay, win or lose, I was there to represent. I made sure I made my round, say hi to everyone, so they know there's Asian presence, you know? That's right. So one year, one year after we lost, everybody left, I walked down the front row to say hi to some of my favorite actors. And I saw some of them, I'm like, oh my God, that's, that's Amelia Clark, that's Khaleesi, that's Jon Snow over there, you know? And then there's Rachel Brosnahan. Do you guys know who she is? Yeah. I love her. She plays the marvelous Miss Maisel. Great show, right? It's an awesome show. And I did a movie with her a few years ago, so I decided to say hi. I was like, oh my God, Rachel, it's so great to see you. Congratulations on everything. And she was like, oh, okay. And I'm like, okay. She probably just forgot who I was. I'm like, look, we did a movie like six years ago called Patriot's Day. You were awesome in that movie. I just want to congratulate you on everything you've done so far. And she was like, oh, yeah, sure. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Is the marvelous Miss Maisel a bitch? <laughs> but I wasn't going to act out of pocket. I was there to represent. <laughs> so I was very nice. I was just like, oh, it's okay. You just don't remember. Um, anyways, I just want to congratulate you for all the nominations on Marvelous Miss Maisel. You're awesome. And she was like, oh... I'm not Rachel Brosnahan. <laughs> I'm Evan Rachel Wood from Westworld. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. I'm the racist person here. <laughs> I think all white people look alike. Everybody in the front row was judging me. John Stone was staring me down. I'm like, you're a bastard. You can't even stare. <laughs> And I didn't know what to do, right? I was profusely sweating, my face was flush red. So I was just like, oh my God, I am so sorry. But either way, it's so nice to meet you. My name is Aquafina. And then I just. <laughs> That's right. That's why it's good to have other representation out there. Asian people, we don't all look alike until we need to. I got a girlfriend now. Thank you. I love her very much, man. She's an amazing person. She's very successful. My girlfriend's a venture capitalist. Yeah, fucking jackpot, right? You know? 
It's great. It's great. Uh, for you guys that don't know what a venture capitalist means, uh, it means that I'm the poorest person she knows. And what that really means is I'm her sugar baby. So it's great. That's right. That's right. Gender equality. That's what I'm talking about. It's time for men to get taken care of. That's right. See that brother high-fiving his girl? Appreciate you, man. Fellow sugar baby. Come on. That's right. That's right. I love her, man. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be a better boyfriend. I'm new to this, like, boyfriend stuff, right? I used to take everything so personally. Like, every time we get into a fight, I'm like, babe, why are, you, why are you mad at me? I'm the perfect boyfriend. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> fellas, fellas, if your girl's mad at you, you can't take that shit personally because it's not even about you. She doesn't even know what she's mad about. You just happen to be there, you know what I mean? You're a victim of circumstance, man. So it's not your job to engage in an argument, it's your job to defuse the situation. You gotta jujitsu that shit until you get to the bottom of the real prom. Like the other week, she was mad at me about something. She was like, babe, I feel like we don't even like go on date nights anymore. I'm like, okay. I hear you. But what's really going on? <laughs> and she was like, well, sometimes I feel like you like hanging out with your buddies more than you like hanging out with me. And I'm like, okay. I hear you. But what's really going on? And then she takes a deep breath. And she was like, <sighs> remember last week on my birthday, Heather brought a cousin and she didn't even know my name. I was like, see, that's your prom right there. <laughs> you ain't got nothing to do with me. Heather's cousin's a bitch, you know, fuck her, man. Let's focus our energy on her. I'm trying to be a better communicator, man. My girl always wants me to talk about my feelings. She's like, babe, I wish you'd talk about your feelings more. I'm like, I feel fine. <laughs> what more do you want me to say? I don't know, I'm not that emotionally involved. I don't know what else, I'm fine. But don't keep asking me that, because the fifth time you ask me that, I might not be fine. <laughs> the fifth time you ask me that shit, some dark shit is gonna come out. It's like, babe, how are you feeling? I don't know, I'm angry all the time. <laughs> because my dad yelled at me after ping pong practice. <laughs> See, guys and girls, we're just different, man. Girls are so emotionally evolved. You know, we even hang out different. One night I came home early, my girl was having a girls' night at the house. I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> the TV was off. Seven girls sitting in a circle making direct eye contact with each other. <laughs> Every candle in the house was lit. And I walked by, I'm like, what is this witchcraft? And I just backed into my own room. <laughs> Fellas, we hang out different. Guys, when we hang out, we sit in a straight line. <laughs> TV on full blast. Zero eye contact with each other. My girl came home early. She was so confused. She was like, babe, you guys didn't talk for like six hours. I'm like, yeah, isn't that fucking awesome? <laughs> That's us. That's guys. But in a relationship, it's important to speak the same language. My girl asked me, she was like, babe, what's your love language? <laughs> I'm like, what? She's like, you know, your love language, like how do you convey love to your partners and loved ones? Like for example, a love language could be words of affirmation. <laughs> I'm like, words of affirmation? <laughs> I was raised by Asian parents. <laughs> I've never heard one word of affirmation in my life. <laughs> Nobody ever told me, Jimmy, you're so great, you can do it. They're like, don't fuck it up. <laughs> Their love language is verbal abuse. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out my love languages. Physical touch, right? It's another love language. Nobody touched me until I was 22. 
I'm not familiar with that. What are some other love languages? Acts of sir. Well, <laughs> I like I like every woman just screaming out at their partner. Acts of service, <laughs> gift giving. <laughs> I think gift giving is a good one. Okay, I love giving gifts to my girl. She loves giving gifts to me. We love that, right? Like for example, I love buying my girl shoes. She loves shoes. And we wear the same shoe size. It's the perfect gift for the whole family. You know what I mean? These are her shoes tonight, you know? It's me perfect. That's right. And in return, I let her wear all of my Jordans. Yeah, guys, you guys know that's love. Because Jordans to guys, that's our most prized possession. If we let you slip into our Jordans, that's like you letting us slip in to you. You know? Same thing. But sometimes, sometimes I get a little nervous because her feet's a little dirty, okay? <laughs> and she's a white girl, so her feet extra dirty. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. White people, I don't know what the fuck you guys do with your feet all day. You guys just barefoot all the time, frolicking around like Jenny from Forrest Gump, you know? White people, you guys got some strong ass feet, man. Just 120 degrees outside, hot cement, just like <laughs> Y'all got some hunter-gatherer feet. <laughs> See, every culture, we got different feet etiquette, all right? White people want to get in touch with Mother Earth. That's great. Black people, on the other hand, I lived with a black roommate for six years. Never saw his toes once. <laughs> He came out the shower with socks on, man. I'm like, what, what the? You got a sock drawer there, brother? Asian people, you guys know the rule. When you come into the house, you take your shoes off, right? You're like, we all know that. Yeah, yeah. But our, but our feet actually never touch the floor. Because when you take your shoes off at the house, we got two pair of house shoes ready for you. And then when you walk outside, we got two pair of Crocs ready for you. And then when you come back in the bedroom, we got two other pair of slippers that we stole from a hotel in Vegas. <laughs> We're ready. Our feet never touch the floor. We got baby soft feet. <laughs> I think Asian people, our most natural love language is acts of service, right? That's what our parents did to us. They might never say I love you, but they did a lot of nice things for us. Every, every night, I don't care how busy my parents were, they'll come home and make a five-course meal. That's love right there, right? Yeah, give it up for them. Yeah, give it up. That's right. In our culture, food is love. I love cooking for my girl. We love cooking together. Food is love. That's why I hate watching all these reality cooking shows where they make food so freaking stressful. Like all these guys with aggressive tattoos and they're just sweating in, in the kitchen. They're like, yes, chef, yes, chef. Two minutes, two minutes, it's still raw, it's still raw. And they're just making fucking scallops. <laughs> There's two items on the menu and they can't handle that shit. You go to any Chinese restaurant, there's about 485 items on the menu. <laughs> and there's one dude back there in the kitchen. He's not even a chef, he's somebody's uncle from Hong Kong. And he knows how to make everything in under 30 seconds. That guy's the real hero, you know what I mean? He got a yellow wife beater that he brought from the old country. Just chilling near the walk, cigarette in his mouth, just like. He's a gangster, man. And he just cusses casually in Cantonese, just like. <laughs> Any of you guys speak Cantonese here? <laughs> Couple of you guys. I was born in Hong Kong, that's my first language. I love that language, right? I think it's the most fun language to speak 
because it's the most fun language to cuss in. <laughs> in Cantonese, you can just like low-key casually cuss. Like you go to Chinatown, you see like a nice old man walk by. He would just be like, ah, right, that sounds really nice, right? But what he actually said was like, oh, fuck your mother and hope your whole family dies. <laughs> That's Cantonese, man. You gotta love it. You gotta love it, man. In a relationship, I think it's important to know how you convey love, but it's just as important to know how you receive love. You gotta be vulnerable and let your partner do nice things for you. See, I'm not very good at that. I, I'm terrible at like directly asking for things that I want. So instead, I just drop little hints. That's called being passive aggressive. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Like for example, I love watching these YouTube videos of Japanese housewives making bento boxes. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice, very cute. It's like a little ASMR, you know? And it's just really nice. This Japanese woman wakes up at 6 a.m. every day to make her working husband a bento box. But I can't ask my venture capitalist girlfriend to make me a bento box. I'm not an idiot, I'm a sugar baby. I know my role. So instead of asking it directly, I just drop little hints. Like we'll be sitting on the couch together. I just pull out my phone and pretend I accidentally stumbled onto this video. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what is this? Bento boxes? <laughs> oh my God, it's so cute. What is that, like a rice ball shaped like a panda? Look, 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 look. <laughs> wow, so she makes this every day for him? <laughs> wow, she must love him so much. <laughs> I thought I was being slick until she came out to one of my shows <laughs> and she heard this joke. <laughs> and she was really upset, man, and rightfully so. I was just up here talking shit, right? We went home, we got into a big five. She was like, babe, that's bullshit, okay? If you want me to do something, why don't you just ask me directly? And if you really want somebody to make you bento boxes, why don't you just go find a Japanese woman? <laughs> I'm like, babe, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, okay, but I think you're missing the point. You don't have to be Japanese to make bento boxes. That's right. That's right. So now I'm making her bento boxes every day. That's how I show my love. You gotta love the people around you. You gotta be nice to the people around you. Your partner, your family, your friends. You gotta keep your day ones around, man. You know, everybody when I was coming up in the game, they gave me this advice. They're like, hey, Jimmy, you wanna be successful? Hang out with successful people because birds of a feather flock together. That's right, man, that's right. You guys heard this before, right? It's fucking bullshit, okay? <laughs> successful people are so boring. I hung out with successful people, they got a successful job, they got a successful family, they don't have time to hang out with your mediocre ass. <laughs> so my real advice to everyone is to find yourself more loser friends. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. I see some of you guys clapping. The ones that are not, you're probably the loser friend, which is fine, I love you. I love you. I love all my friends, man, all my day ones. I used to live in a one bedroom apartment with three comedians. Yeah, ain't nothing wrong with that. I was proud of that. It was all good. They're still my close friends. One of my best friends, his name is Guam. Guam Felix. Yeah, he's a comedian. Uh, he's named after the island he was born on. Guam. Like, you know you kind of hood when you name after the island you were born on. Like, if I came out tonight and they introduced me as Hong Kong Jimmy. I'll probably be selling drugs outside, you know what I mean? But Guam's one of my greatest friends, man. He's just a good dude. He's just a happy-go-around guy, you know? He crashed in my living room for months. And I asked him, like, hey, Guam, you got any plans? You gonna go get a job or something? He was like, nah, dog. I'm gonna get on that government disability, homie. And I'm like, okay, are you disabled? He was like, yeah, I think so, dog. I threw on my back when I was 19, homie. And I'm like, okay, you're 42 right now. I don't think that's gonna work out for you. 
See, Guam is great. He lives by the creed where anything good that happens to him, he makes sure to thank God. Right? That's great. And anything bad that happens to him, he makes sure to blame the government. <laughs> it's a great way to live that when you take zero personal responsibility. <laughs> like he'll say shit like, oh, damn, they gave me a speeding ticket and took away my license, dog. You see, that's how the government fucks you. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure that's how you fuck yourself. <laughs> and then on the positive side, he'll say things like, I just want to thank God because he let me stay with you, dog. I'm like, no, you should thank me, motherfucker. I'll let you stay with me. But I love Guam, man. He's just a happy-go-lucky guy. Doesn't have a lot of ambition in life. His dream in life is to win the lottery. His catchphrase is, when I win the lottery, dog. But he doesn't have good goals for when he does win the lottery, because he'll say shit like, when I win the lottery, we going to the buffet, dog." <laughs> I'm like, boy, we gonna do that right now, bro. <laughs> but Guan was a man of his word. Not only would he buy lottery tickets, he stood in line in every single game show in LA to try to win his lottery. And he finally got on this game show called Let's Make a Deal. Have you guys seen that? Yes, the show that comes on, hosted by Wayne Brady before The Price is Right. But in order to get on that show, you have to wear a costume. And Guam is like a big Pacific Islander brother. So his costume options were limited. He could either be Moana or The Rock, you know? So he decided to make his own costume. He cut up a blue bed sheet, draped it over his body. And then he got a Chinese rice patty hat. And he just wore it. And I'm like, Guam, what the fuck? What, he dressed up as Ho Chi Minh or some shit? And he was like, no, dog. I'm Master Raiden for Mortal Kombat, homie. <laughs> this is a true story. He went on national TV dressed up as Master Raiden. And it's actually an inspirational story. He actually won. Yeah. He won the big deal of the day. It was a $5,000 living room set. Which was perfect for my living room. But he dreamed big. He wanted to win his big prize. So he traded it in for the super deal of the week. And I'm like, this fucking idiot. He traded it in for one out of three chance to win $50,000 cash. One of the biggest prizes on a show ever. And he won! Dream came true. I was watching TV, it was the most magical moment. Money started falling down on his rice paddy hat. And he was so happy, he started doing jumping jacks and shit, and started swimming in a pool of money. And I was watching, I'm like, I knew this motherfucker's not disabled, look at him. <laughs> He's very capable. And he started crying on national TV, he was so happy, and Wayne Brady was like, Guam, congratulations. What are you gonna do with that $50,000? And he was like, we go to the buffet, dog! <laughs> right. That's right. That's a good friend, man. That's why you keep your friends around. He went from the biggest loser I knew to the biggest winner I knew. Took care of all his boys, took us to a lot of buffets. He even took us to the fanciest restaurant he knew, Buca de Beppo. <laughs> it was awesome. He was pawling. But that money didn't last long. That 50 grand lasted about three months. And not only that, he didn't pay any taxes on it. So now he owes the IRS another 20 on top of that shit. And I'm like, Guam, this is horrible. You're worse off than you ever were. And all he said to me, it was like, see, that's how the government fucks you, dog. <laughs> Right. Keep your close friends around and save your money, people. That's why I only like watching real people game shows. I hate watching celebrity family feud because they always make the celebrity choose a charity and donate money. I'm like, some of us want to keep our money, man. <laughs> and look, I know I sound like a bad person, okay? But I love helping people. I love the concept of donating money. 
I just can't do it. I want to, but my mom wouldn't let me. Every time I even just think about donating money, she comes out of nowhere. She's like, who, who are you donating to? I'm like, mom, I don't know, like Save the Children Foundation? She's like, you don't even know those children. <laughs> children can be horrible. Okay, fine, mom, I'll donate to help the hospitals, like feedahospital.com to help out all the nurses and doctors. And she was like, okay, Jimmy, okay. <laughs> the doctors make more money than you. They should donate to you, okay? I make a website at feedacomedian.com right now. <laughs> she just guilt trips me, you know? You donate to anyone, you donate to me. I give a burst to you, okay? Can you imagine I'm on Family Feud? Steve's like, Jimmy, what charity are you playing for? Feedacomedian.com. Um, all proceeds go to my mom. My mom's so tight with my money, she wouldn't even let me buy her something nice. For her last birthday, I bought her a nice iPad. Brand new iPad. I thought I was a good Asian son, right? And my mom's like, oh no, it's too expensive. I'm like, mom, it's okay, we can afford it. Just, just enjoy the iPad. She was like, no, Jimmy, I please return it. Return it and just give me the cash. <laughs> We're practical. We're about the bottom line. See, we live in a very frivolous society, man. Everybody loves to brag about how much shit they have, how much money they make. We all brag. We're all guilty of this. We all just do it in subtle, different ways. Like white people, for example. White people never brag about how much money they got. They always just brag about how expensive their life is. <laughs> like, oh... Joey just started private school, it's so expensive. And our remodel is totally going over budget. Oh, and you wouldn't believe how much money we spent going to Fiji. I'm like, okay, Katie, I see your life, okay? It's a luxurious, good for you, okay. Black people, on the other hand, a lot more straightforward. Black people just tell you exactly how much money they spent on something. It's great. You guys seen it? Like my black friends or even like rappers, right? They love to brag. They're like, this car, 80,000. <laughs> my mama's house, 500,000. <laughs> this chain, a million dollars, man. I'm like, okay, you clearly don't have your priorities straight. <laughs> but I appreciate the honesty. People love to brag about how much money they spend. Asian people, on the other hand, we do the exact opposite. We love to brag about how little money we spent on some shit. Because the art is in the savings. You never pay full price. Like my mom, her catchphrase is guess how much. <laughs> guess how much. Yeah, that's our people. You guys ever play guess how much? My mom would come home with something new, like a watch. She would be like, Jimmy, Jimmy, guess how much? Guess how much? I'm like, mom, I don't know. It's a very nice watch, like $5,000. And she was like, no. It's $200. Jimmy, my house, my house, this house, guess how much? Guess how much? I'm like, mom, I don't know. You live in a very nice house, like a million dollars. She was like, no. It's half off, someone died in it. <laughs> and if you know the rules of the game, you always guess high. So you make the other person feel good about their purchases. Never guess too low. If you ever guess too low, that's the ultimate insult to an Asian person, okay? <laughs> One time my mom came home with some new shoes, I guessed too low. I've never seen her so disappointed in me. She was like, Jimmy, Jimmy, guess how much? Guess how much? I'm like, Mom, I don't know, very nice shoes, like $200. She was like, oh, you. <laughs> Do you even know about shoes? These are $500 Jimmy shoes, okay? Better Jimmy than you. That's how we prank, people. 
You gotta love it, man. I used to be embarrassed about all these things. I thought my mom was cheap. She spoke with an accent. She made me Chinese food. But when I got older, I realized it's all those things that made me different is what makes me interesting now. The tide has turned, man. Everybody want to be more Asian. I'm telling you. Yeah, that's right. Everybody want to be BTS. Everybody want to eat Xiao Long Bao. And every parent I know is trying to send their kid to Chinese immersion school. Just in case we take over this shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> gotta be proud, man. You gotta be proud of how you grew up. You gotta be proud of your parents, right? I'm a good Asian kid. I'm great to my parents. I'll never, ever disrespect them in front of them. You know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> I wanna give you guys a quick update on my dad. Yeah. Richard O. Yang. Yeah, the superstar of the family. Yeah. Talked about in my last special, he became an actor, right? Yeah, yeah, not because he loves the art, it's because it's so easy, you can do it. I can. <laughs> but now he's doing great, he's very successful, okay? He got his whole life turned around, he got out of retirement, he's a full time actor now. And now he wants to be an influencer. <laughs> he just started his own IG account, which is just a nightmare. Because old people, I feel like they mean well, okay? Like my dad, he means well, but he just doesn't know how it works. Like his first post on Instagram was a very nice post. A beautiful picture of the sky, palm trees, birds flying by. I'm like, oh, this is nice. And I scrolled down to the caption and he wrote, all lives matter. <laughs> I'm like, dad, what the fuck, man? Like, <laughs> you don't even know what that means. Why would you write that? It was like, I know, my life will matter, your life will matter, the person's life will matter, okay? Or life will matter. I'm like, that is not what it means. I made him put his account on private, okay? <laughs> Just like a good tiger parent would. Because we know the rules, like young people, we see through the scams of Instagram, right? Like, for example, I follow Sports Center. I understand the first hundred comments are all bots. They're all fake, right? Because there's always some IG booty model saying some stupid shit like, oh, I want something long and hard. And then, <laughs> this is obviously a scam. So one time I clicked on it. <laughs> just to see what's going on, you know what I mean? Research, I just wanna see, I just wanna get to the bottom of it. So I clicked on it, I was like, oh, this is obviously a scam. It's this girl, she's following 7,000 people, but she only has one follower. And I clicked on one follower, it was my dad. <laughs> He's like, my life will matter, her life matters too, okay? <laughs> my dad just from a different generation. He is like a weird beauty standard. Like for us, we just say things on very surface level, just like, oh, this person's attractive, this person's not, right? My dad would get into the weeds. <laughs> My dad would give you all the weird details. He would be like, oh, she's beautiful. Very long arms. <laughs> I'm like, what are you recruiting for a linebacker? What are you talking about? I can never get a pulse on who he thinks is attractive or not, right? One time I'm like, dad, oh, she's really good looking. And my dad was like, no. Her mouth's too close to her nose. She can't breathe, she can't breathe. I see some of you guys looking at your partner and it's like, is my nose too close? And that's exactly what an Asian parent does to you, you know? Make yourself conscious about shit you didn't even know about. I was very nervous to introduce my girlfriend to my dad. Cause she's absolutely beautiful. But who knows if her wingspan is long enough for his life. Right? <laughs> I was so nervous, man. The first time I brought my girlfriend to my dad's house and to his credit, I want to give him credit. He actually didn't say anything crazy. Because for some reason, when an old Chinese person sees white people, they just start acting right. <laughs> like his posture changed and stood upright. And for some reason, he just came up with a British accent. <laughs> like me and my girlfriend walked in the house, he didn't say anything crazy. He just looked at us, he was like, oh. <laughs> Prosperous young couple. 
And my girlfriend was so confused. It's like, why does your dad sound like Helen Mirren? And I start saying all these nice things about my girl. I'm like, oh, dad, you know, yeah, she's, she's very successful, but she's also very nice. And her family, they're just great people. And my dad was like, good. All lives matter. <laughs> I love my dad, man. I love my dad. He's a great dad. He's a funny guy, you know? And we did a lot of father and son bonding growing up. Like, for example, I'm a big basketball fan. I love watching the NBA. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, I grew up a Los Angeles Clippers fan. Yeah. Because my dad was cheap, okay? Because my dad was... <laughs> because the Lakers and the Clippers play in the same stadium, but the Clippers tickets were half price. So my dad's like, never pay full price. Never, never. <laughs> that wasn't even the most embarrassing part. The most embarrassing part was when we exited the stadium. When we exited Staples Center, there'll be hot dog street vendors out there, right? Latino brothers selling bacon wrap hot dogs for $5. I love those things. And my dad would go up and haggle with them. <laughs> he would go up and be like, okay, I give you $5 for two hot dogs. I'm like, Dad, it's not buy one, get one free at Costco. Just give him 10 bucks. And he's like, shh, never pay full price. <laughs> okay, I'll give you $8 for two hot dogs, final offer. And the guy didn't care. He's like, no, it's $10. And then my dad, this is his strategy. He just announces in front of everyone. Make sure everyone hears him. He's like, okay, we walk away. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, I don't care. I don't think he cares if you walk away. Don't walk away, I'm hungry. He's like, Jimmy, it's better to be hungry than to pay full price. <laughs> and then my mom comes up behind us with four hot dogs. And she was like, guess how much? <laughs> Thank you, guys. You guys are amazing. I love you guys.